somebody with this thing. So the way I always start the lecture on these things that there, um, there is some taxonomic truth to the common names. I, as an ichthyologist, I'm sort of not a big fan of common names because there's a lot of uh, regional differences to common names that uh, don't help us out in communicating, right? You guys are going to have to communicate amongst yourselves. And the best way to do that is with the scientific names in the end. Um, but there are general features of these common names. So start with chubs. Most of them are relatively rare, species-wise. So we'll skip through a bunch pretty quick. But chubs tend to have a, a cylindrical body and cross-section. They're not elliptical. Um, most of them have barbels in the corner of the mouth. Some of the barbels are so small you would need a hand lens in the field to, to spot them. But it's certainly a character that you can use back in the lab uh, to identify things. Um, generally speaking, fewer than 65 lateral scales, so they have a, a relatively um, you know, large scaled appearance to them. Um, mostly cryptic in coloration, they, they want to try to blend in. Lateral stripes, caudal spots, speckling, you see a lot of that in these. Uh, there's only a, a few that are, that are all that silvery. Um, generally speaking, chubs are a, a flowing water phenomenon, and so we've got uh, Five genera that will we'll slide through here relatively quickly. The common ones, <coughs> you know, look, at, look at the range map here, um, are things like creek chub. And I thought there was, I can use this, I suppose, um, as a pointer. Uh, creek chub flowing waters can get fairly large. It's actually fairly piscivorous, so it eats a lot of smaller fish. Um, but notice, again, cylindrical in cross-section, it's got stripes, it has speckling. Uh, because it's piscivorous, it has a relatively large mouth, but the key here, the key two features are a blotch of pigment there and a blotch of pigment there. If you were to take it back to the lab or look at it with a hand lens, you'd see that there's a really small barbell in the corner of the mouth. Um, and that's the creek chub. Those are the, the key features. I'm going to focus on the, you, you have to develop a facility with you know getting to the idea that it's, a, it's probably a chub and then you look for a, a few key features that's the way that, that that my brain works after I you know went through a few classes like this rather than having to key out every last fish that you know that's not very fun so the key field characters here pigment there pigment there large mouth tiny um, barbell in the corner Often confused with horny head chub, especially when horny head chub is not in a breeding condition or it's a female. This is a non-breeding female. Here's a breeding male. It's easy to easy to understand why they call it horny head chub. Those are nuptial tubercles. Um, they are. Um, oh, I always forget. They're cartilaginous, I believe. Cartilaginous spikes that accumulate in various parts of a breeding minnow or sucker. Suckers and minnows um, often have tubercles in breeding condition. So you can only rely upon that character for males right now, right, for a couple of months. After that, they lose the tubercles. They look more like that. Uh, so what, what horny head chubs have, they're large. Their mouth is not quite as big as, as the creek chub. Uh, particularly breeding males have a reddish patch there, although you can still make out a little bit of orange there. Uh, they lack the pigment here at the base of the dorsal that the, that the uh, creature has. Uh, strong pigment uh, patch there. When they're young, they have bright orange fins. It's very easy to pick them out of a, a bucket of mixed minnows if you're doing an um, index of biotic, biotic integrity work. Most chubs, as I said, are rare around here, and most of them are affiliated with large rivers. As you will note, our large rivers are dammed. They are um, wing dammed. They, you know, they have uh, uh, navigational structures. The, the feature of large rivers that's relatively rare these days is the, the free-flowing, shifting sand habitat. And we have a great um, intact or um, rehabbed shifting sand habitat in the lower Wisconsin River. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent resource. I always tell students, if you haven't canoed the lower Wisconsin, uh, from Lake Wisconsin down to the mouth of the, where it's flowed into the Mississippi. It's one of the most remote places. Very beautiful, lots of sand habitat. 
Um, so most of these things are found in, in those situations. Uh, this one just happens, we're at the, at the extreme northern part of the brain, uh, the gravel chub. It's only found in a few streams um, in other parts of the state, the rock system, including the Hecatonica and the Ahara. Uh, it has X-shaped spots on its side. That's what X bump cleaving means. Uh, and you, if you looked closely to you, you would see a barb along this. Shoal chub is a very large barb, and it's speckled. Also only found in a few large rivers, uh, Mississippi, below Wisconsin. Silver chub is a little more common locally anyways. Um, it doesn't have the status that the other species do. I meant to put status on these here, but I didn't have time. Uh, silver chub is the exception to my chub rule in that it's all silver. It's, it's very silvery. It doesn't have a lot of, a lot of pigmentation, no stripes, no spots. Um, but it's got a very distinct a very distinct head, um, kind of baku, uh, and, and, a, and a tucked under or a subterminal uh, mouth arrangement. They get very large, great bait, right? <laughs> Pointing at the big river people. Do you catch a lot of these in your neck of the woods? No. More, more uh, shad. But yeah, they're very large. Many chubs that you go west of here, a lot of you're getting jobs west of here, um, you know, sickle fin chub, flathead chub. Many chubs have this, this uh, caudal fin arrangement where there's a light stripe on the, on the bottom edge of the caudal fin, and sort of a dusky patch on the lower lobe. You see that too in many of the species. Here's a, here's a, uh, a Great Lakes tree. So if you're from, if you hail from Great Lakes towns, maybe you've seen these things before. Maybe you have, they're sort of a slate gray, steel gray. Uh, they get fairly large too, you know, six, six, eight inches is uncommon. Um, pointed fins and a very large um, nasal flap. Pointed head is, is the, the lake chub, Quisius plumbius. Plumbius refers to that, that sort of steel gray condition. Plumbius means lead, it's kind of lead colored. But it's found essentially in, in you know, harbors and inshore areas on the Great Lakes around here. I'd love to get after some of them, look in the collection and figure out where some good spots are. Maybe some of you guys know. Does that leave chubs behind? Question. Do you want me to pass the reason? You can if you want. I just, so there, we basically have all the species I'm talking about up here on display. It might be too distracting, I don't know. Or it might keep people away. <laughs> The only one that isn't in there is the gravel. Sorry? The only one that isn't in there is the gravel, the chub. gravel chub. Yeah. Okay. So we have them all. You're welcome to look through. Many of you have seen them, right, under duress during jam study. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, tend to be cylindrical and cross-sectioned, but generally speaking, they lack barbels. Um, again, another group with fewer than 65 lateral scales, so they don't have a fine-scaled appearance, and they're often cryptically colored with lateral stripes, caudal spots, speckling. Minnows can they're be in line. Flowing waters. They're in line. They're kind of in order. -ish. Yeah, they're in order. They should be. And we only have two genera of true minnows. This one is one of the most, this species is one of the most commonly occurring species in the state. You saw the creek chub range. Creek chub needs flowing water. Blood-nosed minnow can be in lakes as well as, as flowing water. I've caught blood-nosed minnows, really big ones, like six inches, while ice fishing for panfish, you know, in, in lakes around here. Uh, so they're, they're around, they're very prevalent. Um, as I said, one of the most common species in the state. Pomepheles as a genus, there's three species of Pomepheles minnow, has crowded nape scales. So there's scales that are smaller here behind the head versus other parts of the body. And that's fairly distinct. There's only a few other entities on this list that have that condition. 
most of which you will not confuse with, um, with them being in this, in this genus anyways. The blunt-nosed minnow is, is um, of this genus, the minnow that has the subterminal mouth. So there's a bit of a snout that sticks out uh, in front of the mouth. All members of Clemethiles, I forgot to mention, also have this reduced first dorsal ray. So their, their dorsal fins tend to look rounded compared to some of the other things on the list. This is a male in breeding condition here. This is what the average fish looks like, say, in August, um, when none of them are in breeding condition. So the, you see ductural tubercles there. Specifically with the blunt nose minnow, besides um, having that subterminal mouth, you have a fair lateral stripe, um, kind of diffuse, and a very strong caudal spot. Um, the bullhead minnow is, is found in larger rivers alongside the chubs that I mentioned. It can be locally common, and this right here, I like to point this out, this is a UWSP find. When, when I got here, I took some students out in the fishery society and we caught blunt nose minnows, I'm sorry, bullhead minnows. Look at how far they were afield from other populations. So that's pretty amazing. That was fun. I didn't, didn't think they would be there. Anyways, blunt nose minnows look similar, I'm sorry, bullhead minnows look similar to blunt nose minnows in that they have a, a lateral stripe, but they lack the subterminal mouth. The mouth is, is relatively terminal, it's at the tip of their snout. Uh, they have a very concise caudal spot, and they have a very concise dorsal spot. Uh, and if you'll recognize their lateral stripe as being less diffuse, it's sort of long and thin, instead of being broad like the, the blunt nose minnow. This is, everybody knows this one, guy of minnow. Surprisingly not that commonly caught by us when we go out there. I mean, it's, it's broadly distributed, um, but it, it it's not at high density like the blunt nose minnow is or a creek chub. So we don't get a lot. If we, if we go out to the, the Wisconsin River or we go out to the, the Plover River or something like that, we break sands all day and probably get five of these, but we get 300 blunt nose minnows. This is a male in, in breeding condition. That's where they get <coughs> their name, Fathead. Um, you see tubercles there. They have these saddle patches. Most individuals are going to look like this most of the year. Um, they are very heavy up front. Both bullhead minnows and blunt nose minnows are more proportionately, um, we call it fusiform or torpedo shaped. These guys are a little heavier up front. Uh, they, they have a terminal mouth. They lack a caudal spot despite what these specimens show. They have a dorsal spot. Um, and in preservation, especially, they have some streaks. I don't know if you can kind of see that. There's streaks that start at the lateral area and move their way up to the, the back of the fish. So those, those streaks are relatively um, distinct. Something you may catch alongside members of, of, of Pomepheles, the, the, the genus, are brassy minnows. Oops. And as Talon will tell you, Talon's my lab technician right now. I Homer, hate brassy minnows. Confused me the most. Homer sorting fish, fast and furious. Uh, this one is just a uh, bad picture. They don't really look that spectacular. Um, they're relatively uniformly colored. They can have a brassy cast. They can be greenish. Um, but you, you'll you'll stumble on them because they 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 sort of look like everything and nothing all at the same time. They look a little shiner-like. Their, their body's a little more elliptical in cross-section than some of the other minnow groups. Uh, but notice they don't have that foreshortened first dorsal ray. And they also have scales on the nape that are about the same size as scales across the rest of their back. Uh, so they wouldn't have that crowded nape scale appearance. And they tend to like medium-sized flowing waters, whereas you find, as I said, blunt nose minnows and fathead minnows just about anywhere. These you would not find so much in, in, in lakes. There's only 